Our Catechism recitation for this evening continues our review of the small catechism teaching on the Lord's Prayer. Tonight, the seventh petition and its meaning. What is the seventh petition of the Lord's Prayer? But, but deliver us from evil. What does this mean? We pray in this petition as the sum of all that our Father in heaven would deliver us from every evil of body and soul, property and honor. And finally, when our last hour has come, grant us a blessed end and graciously take us from this veil of tears to himself in heaven. Opening him this evening, number 451 in the Lutheran hymnal, stand up, stand up for Jesus. Christ to grant us forgiveness. 
and take your head from me. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. So it was, when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Then David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone, and he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead, so that the stone sank into his forehead, and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore, David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword, and drew it out of its sheath, and killed him, and cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. Here ends the blessing. The epistle for this 21st Sunday after Holy Trinity is St. Paul's epistle to the Ephesians, the sixth chapter. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Here ends the epistle. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst for me earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art Alleluia, alleluia. They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abideth forever. Alleluia. We respond with the triple alleluia verse. John, the fourth chapter. So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him 
and implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then Jesus said to him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. The nobleman said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your son lives. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. Then he inquired of them the hour when he got better. And they said to him, Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said to him, Your son lives. And he himself believed and his whole household. This again is the second sign Jesus did when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. This is the Gospel of the Lord.
grace to you and peace. From God your Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior and Comforter, over sin and death and the devil for you. From the Holy Spirit, who descends to the gospel this night and clads you with the armor of God that you may be able to withstand the assaults of the evil one and win the victory in Christ. Amen. You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. For you are a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. This nine foot tall giant named Goliath. The earlier verses from this particular chapter, chapter 17 in the first book of the prophet Samuel, were omitted from our reading for this night. But as you know well the story, Goliath himself did not go into battle without his armor, his breastplate, the lower armor that shielded his legs, and the helmet, all held together by the buckler, the belt, about his waist. A very imposing figure indeed, not just because of his enormous, almost unworldly height, but bearing armor, plus his sword, his spear, his javelin, and the shield-bearer that went before him. He's a man of war and he knows how wars are fought and how they are lost, especially by those who are not equipped for the battle. How then did David dare to go out and face this giant of a man, this warrior, without any armor at all. Saul, King Saul of Israel, tried to convince David to at least wear his when he realized that this rash young man would not take no David for an answer in his zeal, wanting to face this giant that no warrior of Israel dared to face. Again, he tried Saul's armor, but it was too big. Saul, as you will remember, is a very tall man himself, no nine-footer, but taller than the typical child of Israel of that day. And David, being a much younger man at the time, would be smaller still. So he tried it. It didn't work. He knew it wouldn't help. And he took it off. And then he went into battle. But not without the armor of God. That armor is invisible to the human eye. It's very real. It's very protective. Indeed, the fact that it is an armor from God, for God's people, as they fight in the army of God, the good fight of faith, God is going to make sure that it is fully functional and effective. 
and you see the result. David is not harmed one whit and wins the battle against this giant with a stone, a sling, and the word of God. This is what David relied on. That God would protect him, and that God would, through this young shepherd boy, David, win the victory against seemingly impossible odds. At least is how the world would see them. But David had chosen the right stone, skilled with the sling. He threw it and struck Goliath in just the right spot of his forehead that his head was crushed. The word makes it clear that it sank into his forehead and Goliath fell upon his face to the ground. David knew the truth. The truth that was the belt that held his armor together about his waist. It's the very same armor that centuries later St. Paul describes to the Christians at Ephesus and of which we are reminded again this night. Paul isn't describing anything new. He's describing what God has given to his saints from the very beginning. When Adam and Eve, our first parents, fell to the temptation of the giant Goliath in the form of the serpent, indeed the devil in the flesh. They knew they were naked. They knew that they were exposed before God. But let's back up for a moment. Why did they not have holding on to begin with? For one, the climate was perfect. But even more, because in their perfection, created in the very image of God, they can not only look upon each other without any sense of shame, without any feelings of lust, to look like God himself would look upon that perfect human body and say, wow, we are fearfully and wondrously made by our God. And they knew no shame because they knew no sin. But with the fall into sin, everything changed. And they needed to cover themselves up quickly grabbing some fig leaves and trying to fashion some aprons to cover up those parts that as they looked upon each other, they felt the shame and the guilt and the lust and all the untoward things that now plague fallen humankind. Of course, as soon as they plucked those leaves from the fig tree, those leaves began to wither, and soon enough would dry up and crumble, and they would be exposed once again. Because that is not how sin and guilt is to be covered up. God instead provided for them tunics of animal skins, 
lambs sacrificed innocently, not because they had done anything wrong, but because Adam and Eve had done wrong in God's sight. Sin leads to death. And in this case, the sin of man led to the death of the Lamb that God had appointed to be that first sacrifice that would point forward to another one. Even there, as God declared his gracious mercy and forgiveness of Adam and Eve, we hear the first prophecy of the Christ, the seed of the woman, foretelling of a virgin birth, of a son, who would crush the head of the serpent more than the bruise the head of the serpent, as many of our English language translations will say of that verse. And in the bestowing of those tunics, God gives Adam and Eve his armor, a covering, firstly of righteousness, declaring that he has brought them back onto his side by his mercy. That he now covers their heart with his love so that they might know that they are loved and they stand rightly before God, hence the breastplate of righteousness. He has bestowed upon them forgiveness of their sin, which he will proclaim to them over and over again throughout their lives, even as he does for us. And with the forgiveness of sins, there is salvation. There is the bestowing of the helmet upon our heads that we might know that our minds are protected from the lies of the devil, just like as Goliath said, no one can defeat me, not even your God, O Israel, as he blasphemed and cursed the one and only living God of the universe. So we are protected from the blows as Satan tries to beat into us his lies, leading us to look at the fallen world and say, there's your reality. While well, God who has crowned us with salvation already, that he will one day exchange for a crown for those who through faith conquer even unto death. We know who we are. Princes and princesses of God sent it now onto the battlefield but knowing that we win because our Lord Jesus has already won this victory. The same Jesus, the Son of David in the flesh, who will come into the world and there naked on his cross, would hang nevertheless covered by the armor of God. See, Jesus goes through everything that we do. Jesus is equipped in every way that we are. Plus, he is the very Son of God, incarnate in the flesh. We see that what Jesus is given is certainly all sufficient for him, even as it is for us. He was protected by his Father as he died upon the cross for the sins of the world. For he is delivered from sin and death on the third day. And then, having come back to life anew, he walks this world clad in the 
choose in the preparation of the gospel of peace to walk in the way of peace, to declare his peace to the people of peace gathered here on this night. Peace in the midst of the battles that we face. We're not talking this night about our battles with flesh and blood, but with the spiritual powers that continue to fight against God's people as if they could win. They win against the world, sad, but not so you, because you have put on this gospel armor. God has poured it upon you with the waters of holy baptism. He cleanses and polishes that armor as he declares the word of forgiveness so that you know that you are standing righteous before him again. By the power of his holy word and his holy spirit which you hear, you stand firm. And holding the shield of faith, you are able to turn away all the lies that Satan continues to throw your way. Your God doesn't love you. Look at you suffer. If he loved you, why do you suffer so? Because we hear the word for what it is and we believe the word. Like the nobleman who goes 25 miles from his town of Capernaum, hearing that Jesus is in Cana, to beg him to come and heal his dying son. And yet at the end, when Jesus says, go your way, your son lives, he believes the word of Jesus. That this word can transcend that space of 25 miles and accomplish what Jesus says, even when he may be a, quite a distance away. Because indeed, Jesus is not away from the presence of his people. Wherever you are, so is your Lord. So is his Holy Spirit. And so is the power of his word. So as we wield the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, to slay the devil, to push back against the lying, fallen world, and to even tame our own fallen flesh when we stand with feet to clay. In repentance, we turn back to the God who has such power and power in our lives that we stand firm. Stand in Jesus. Stand victorious. Forever. Amen. Peace of God who surpasses all understanding. Guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Yeah. Almighty God, Lord Jesus Christ, in 
indeed we give you thanks and praise for having won the victory for us over the one who seems enormous to us, the devil, the even greater monster of our sin and looming even larger than that, our final enemy of death. And yet by your life for us, your death on the cross for us, your resurrection from the tomb for us, you have conquered them all for us. And then you equip us so that we might live this life fully confident in your victory for us. And that we are fully armored, protected, and loved by the one who has so protected us. Continue to grant unto us the faith, the word, the spirit, the power, so that we might continue to walk faithfully through this life as your church and in the world and as Christians individually to give witness to your victory, to your ongoing power, and to our eternal salvation through faith in you. Bless the missionary endeavors of your church in all places, that despite all of these challenges and difficulties, that through the preaching of teaching of your word, in the administration of your sacraments, many more faithful soldiers would be joined into your army and into your church forever. We pray that you would continue to march into our lives and continue to bring blessings abundant in every aspect of them. We pray that you might Bless each and every one of us with good health and healing and strengthening in our times of hurting and weaknesses. Even so, we pray these blessings for Jim and Darlene and Ted and Brenda and Carol and Karen and Kyle battling another bout of cellulitis. Marianne, me, Krista. We pray that you would continue to intervene in the lives of our beloved ones, our family members and friends, so that you would meet them in their time of need and provide what is best for each and every one. So we pray on this night for Shar and Jim and Paul and Mike. We pray that you would bless this world with peace, putting an end to warfare in the Ukraine, in the Middle East. We pray that you would bring peace in the streets and lanes of our cities and villages, and that you would likewise work a unity and harmony that indeed we might as one people in these United States of America continue to live as one nation under God, and that you would grant unto us in our prosperity the blessings of liberty and justice under the rule of law, even as you would bestow your peace. We pray for a peaceable end to this current election season, and pray that indeed your will would be done. We ask also your tender mercies upon our neighbors and in all of their needs, especially for those in the southeastern portion of the United States, reeling in the aftermath of hurricanes, tropical storms, floods, mudslides, and all that has come through those these and all things whatsoever thou would have us ask of thee, we pray 
in your holy name, Lord Jesus, asking that they would be bestowed upon us for the sake of the, your bitter sufferings and death. O oh, you, our Lord and Savior, who liveth and reigneth with the Father and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Oh, Lord, be with you. Oh, 
Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take ye, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took a cup when he had supped, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the remission of sins. Do this as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Welcome to the table prepared for the warriors of God. Take me. This is the true body of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given unto death for all of your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Shed for the remission of all of your sins. The true blood of Jesus Christ shed for the forgiveness of all of your sins. His body and his blood strengthen and keep your own flesh and blood in the one true faith and ever fighting the good fight until life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Fight the good fight. 